Heavenly Father, I am so incredibly appreciative for what you've done in this place. Maybe I get to see more of it, Father, because I'm in touch with the guys overseas and I'm in touch with so many people. So I do have a, a distinct vantage point that very few in the congregation have. So, I guess I'm very blessed to see your mighty hand in Beth Yeshua. Well, Father, I also know that although most of the people that attend here, maybe, maybe they don't have the same vantage point that I have, but they'd have to be blind not to be able to see what you're doing. Father, I, I hope and pray that when we come back to reconvene as a family, and I don't know when that's going to be. That's not up to me. It could be in two weeks. It could be in two months. Nobody really knows. But I hope when the people finally come back in here, they come back with a new zeal and a new appreciation for what they have and what you've done. Because I think to not have that, Father, is a disgrace to you and your name. Father, the only thing I would ask you personally is to please help me. <laughs> help me to bring glory to your name. Help me to do what I desire to do, which is to lift you up. I'm, I'm limited, Lord. And my desire is to lift you up. I pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. I'll go for the tissues early today. Well, it is the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Lord asks us to have a holy convocation. And as always, whenever we have a holy convocation that the Lord has requested of us, um, God always shows. And I don't know if you can feel him in your homes, but I could definitely feel him here. No question about it. He's in every, every window, every, every chair. He's sitting in every chair. It's unbelievable right now. Um, the Feast of the Lord. I mean, there's books written on the subject. I've, I've never read one. Um, I've read Leviticus 23 many, many, many times. But the Feast of the Lord were appointed, appointed times, by God, to distinguish the people of God from all other people. The world doesn't celebrate God's feasts. The people of God celebrate God's feasts. And that's how God distinguishes us. That's how we're kind of different. Uh, we have a whole different system of, of living. When we observe them, we're being obedient, for sure, but when we, when we observe them, we're... we're we keep walking out the remembrance. Remembrance is a big deal in Judaism. It's a big deal with God. The word is zichronot, and we're always supposed to remember. Why? Because human beings forget so easily what they should remember, and they remember the things they should forget. We hold on to things um, that people have done to us. We hold on for, I mean, years, 20 years, 30 years, a lifetime. Um, of two family members could have a, an argument at a Thanksgiving and they've held the grudge to death. And yet we tend to forget how good God is. We tend to forget the blessings that, the, that those family members have been to us. We forget all the great things they've done for us. So remembrance is very important. But specifically when it comes to the feast, guys, 
We're supposed to remember the benefits we've already received as well as the prophetic benefits yet to come. In other words, putting Shabbat aside for a moment, there's six feasts, and you know this, and I just, forgive me for being repetitive, but three of them relate to Yeshua's first coming. That's these spring feasts, and we remember. We remember his death on the cross. We remember his burial. We remember first fruits, his resurrection. We remember him writing the Torah on our hearts. We remember him sending the Holy Spirit to energize our hearts to walk things out. We remember these things. And forgive me, but you know, when we sing songs about Yeshua's death and things like this, I think that song should be sung every day, not just on Passover. Every day you should remember that the angel of death has to pass you by. I, I wouldn't wait till Passover to celebrate that. However, God knows that we forget. God knows we get busy. So he just sets aside a special season. And then there's this big interlude, which we are in right now. There's this big interlude. We're in it right now. We're in the wilderness going to the promised land. And the only way we're going to get there is for Yeshua to return, which is Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. So we're, 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 we're rehearsing. That's what feasts are. Prophetic feasts are rehearsals. We're rehearsing for when the king comes. I'm sure the music team got together probably last night and rehearsed these songs. We need to rehearse the coming of the king. Guys, can you just imagine if the whole believing world celebrated Shabbat? No more Messianic Jew, no more, you know, uh, um, Seventh-day um, Adventist, no more... Um, Shabbat observing Baptists. There's a group of Baptists. They're, they're Seventh day Baptists. How about no more? How about just, just children of God who celebrate God's feasts? Well, the Shabbat's a no brainer. The other ones, you know, we can discuss, but the Shabbat's a no brainer. We, we, it's a no brainer. We will celebrate it from one new moon to another and from one Shabbat to another, all flesh. It will happen at the end of the millennial reign. We, we will. We will. But just imagine, imagine if a major denomination just announced today, we are going to honor Shabbat from here on in, how much more unity there would be. And that's a big part of the feast. The feast created uni unity that God wanted with his children. He wanted his children being unified and getting along and looking out for each other. But when we have all these different feasts and all these different doctrines, it's really impossible to have unity. Because no matter what, no matter how much you agree on, the minute you disagree, you're going to feel a wall. You're going to feel somewhat of a wall. I know, I know it. And that's not what God wanted for his namesake or his children. And as far as a reminder, why do we do these things over and over again? Well, you would never tell your little child just one time to look both ways when they cross the street. You tell them over and over again. Why? Because that's how human beings learn doing a routine repetitiously. It's just the way we're designed. If Passover is to remind us of our redemption, which obviously it is, no question about it, then the Feast of Unleavened Bread is to remind us of the kind of lives redeemed people are supposed to live. Once, once the children of Israel were out of Egypt, they had to get Egypt out of them. And this process, before they got to Israel, God was working that in the wilderness. He was sanctifying them in the wilderness. That's what's happening. Right now, every believer on planet Earth is being sanctified in the wilderness. We're not home yet. That's just what's going on. It's, it's not uh, hard to figure out. These are not deep spiritual ideologies like some people get into. Some people, you know, they love to be on a submarine, but you've got to up periscope every now and then. You keep going deep. Forgive me, but I see people over my years. Now I'm, you know, I used to say I'm not a believer that long. Well, it's 31 years. It's a long time. I've watched people so deep, and yet their families are, are falling apart. So deep, and yet they fall apart when, when something, you know, horrific happens. All hell breaks loose. It's not that deep. God did not write the Bible to confuse us. He wrote it for Amharets, common people. Um, in a way, I'm glad that the 
unleavened bread is coming to a close because I got to tell you, I love matzah and I eat it constantly. I could eat matzah for dinner. I just need a little bit of butter. And for you, uh, uh, maybe newbies to the feast, um, try egg and onion matzah. You haven't lived till you tried egg and onion matzah. There's nothing like it. It's hard to get around Macon, but you know, if you go to densely populated Jewish areas like you know South Florida or the Northeast, you know, it's, it's you have a plethora of egg and onion matzah. You can get this stuff up in Atlanta constantly, but you know, there's just let's face it, there's just not a ton of people in Macon celebrating Passover. <laughs> But um, egg and onion matzah is tremendous. And there's, there's something that Bernadette makes. You know, she takes sugar and, and um, uh, butter to make her own caramel. And then she takes chocolate, melts it down, and puts it over the matzah. And it's, it's, it's very dangerous. In fact, it's so dangerous, we call it in our house matzah crack because it's addictive. So once you start, you're, 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 a, you're a matzah crack addict. That's what happens. Um, yeah, I've been celebrating it for a long time. I even have my matzah socks on. It's Bernadette got them for me. It's called Matza Matza. And um, anyway, um, sadly enough, as a, as a traditional Jewish person, I didn't really understand the, the I knew I understood the meaning historically, what we were celebrating about the redemption of my people and how we should all experience redemption and deliverance at the Seder. But in Yeshua, we have, this is the best of both worlds. We have the rich history. We have the, the experience of being delivered personally. And then we have the final exodus to come. I mean, you know, the Jewish people don't have that. The Christian people don't have that. Forgive me. You, you might say, do you think you're, you're better than the Jewish people? Do you think you're better, Rabbi, than the Christian people? No, I just think I'm better off. Not better, better off. And for you that catch flack from, from, from some family members or some friends, don't you dare let them give you a hard time. Don't you dare let them. Why are they so much more angry that you're doing it than you are angry about them not doing it? Did you ever think about that? Why are they so angry about me celebrating on Shabbat? I'm not angry that they celebrate on Sunday. I'm not even remotely angry. Why? But what are they so upset about? Don't, don't let them get to you. Don't let them rain on your parade, man. Only you can let them steal your joy. They can't take it from you. They can't take it. You can't lose your joy. It, it's like virginity. You don't wake up one morning and go, where did I put that thing? You give it away. You give away your joy. That's your decision. Rabbi, but they, they hock me. They hock me. They, 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 they know where. Don't, don't tell them where your goat is tied up. And they can't get to it. Don't let them. And if you're around the family member that constantly berates you, don't be around that family member. If they're toxic, I would, I would sit them down and go, if you love me, you have a sure, funny way of showing it. I'm trying to get close to God. What is the problem here? I'm trying to honor him. I'm enjoying it. And you're just berating me? How about this? If you really love me, let's never talk about this again. Don't do it to yourself. You don't have to. You're going to make yourself sick. I used to spend time, you know, trying to prove that we should all do this. Now I just spend time celebrating. You follow? I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to help you. Um, let's look at our first uh, set of scriptures, okay? Obviously, we go to in, in the book of Corinthians because, you know, Paul uses the Passover to, to make a point. So it's, it's really a no-brainer here. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 7 says... Your boasting is not good. He's speaking to the, to the members of this Corinth congregation. Don't you know the saying, quote, there was a saying in Judaism. It takes only a little chumetz, a little leaven, to leaven a whole batch of dough. That was the saying. Like we have colloquialisms in America. You know, kill two birds at one stone, that's colloquialism. They had colloquialisms in the Hebrew culture, and this was one of them. Get rid of the old chumetz. Get rid of the old leaven so that you can be a new batch of dough. Because in reality, you are. You are unleavened. That's the reality of it. For our Pesach, Passover lamb, the Messiah, Yeshua, has been sacrificed. Now, forgive me, but it is not possible for me to just, you know, give a verse out of context. 
because there are things um, that disgust a person. Um, what disgusts me probably disgusts you. Child abuse. Disgusting. Spousal abuse, even if it's manipulative and not physical. Disgusting. Um, there's, now, there's now senior abuse. Even though I'm not an animal lover, animal abuse disgusts me. Let me tell you what else disgusts me. When I hear somebody taking a verse and preaching on it, it disgusts me. It disgusts me because there is no way, if they don't teach in context, are they going to get the meaning correct. And then they're teaching other people the incorrect meaning, and they're going to teach their little people and other people the incorrect meaning, and it spreads like a, like a virus, really. So forgive me, but this is a pet peeve with me. For instance, if I gave you these verses, which I'm giving you, and, I, and it says your boasting is not good, and I said to you, what are they boasting about? What would your answer be? You have no idea. There's no way because you're reading it out of context. So what do you do? You don't pay attention to that. Like a lot of times, you read a verse, you go, well, I don't know what that means, and who cares about context? I just know I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What does that mean? What, what is he saying to the people in Philippi? What's going on? Guys, I, how many times have I said context, but like my wife says, we need reminders, so a reminder it is. So Paul is reproving the Corinthians for their boasting. And he's using the theme of Passover, which is why we, we chose it, to reprove them. Unless we read in context, we won't know what they're boasting about. If we don't read it in context, we run the risk of taking the verse or verses out of context and thereby misinterpreting them, which Satan just loves. What did Satan say at the beginning? Did God really say, guess what? If you don't read in context, you won't be able to answer that. You'll be like, I don't know if he really said, because I don't really read in context. And he's going to constantly twist things out of context because text taken out of context is pretext. How many times does somebody have a motivation of their heart, but their words don't match their motivation? And it comes out, and what happens? You take it the wrong way, you get perturbed, and you're in a massive fight over a little miscommunication because this is what the devil does. He twists iniquity in, in Hebrew is avon. It's a twisting. He twists. So your motivation might be all right, but the way you said it was all wrong, and all they know is what you said. Nobody knows the motivation of another heart. I think after listening to me so long, you know the motivation of my heart. You know I want to glorify God. I want you to stay strong in the faith. I want your marriages to be strong. And it comes out sometimes. If you don't know that, if you were to come here one day and hear me speak, you'd be like, wow, that guy epitomizes a loudmouth, obnoxious New York Jew who thinks he has all the answers. I am a loudmouth for the Lord. I am a Jew from New York, yes. But arrogant, no, no shot. The only thing I'm arrogant about is the greatness of God, period, end of story. That is the only thing I'm arrogant about. I'm not arrogant about me, my family, nothing. I'm arrogant about the greatness of God, and I always will be arrogant about the greatness of God. So if you are thinking that if you stay long enough and I might change, you're wrong. I'm going to disappoint you for a long time, okay? So let's get a little context. Let's go back to the beginning of the chapter, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1, I, I find this unbelievably exciting. You have no idea how exciting I find the word of God. <laughs> it is actually being reported that there is sexual sin among you. And it is sexual sin of a kind that is condemned even by pagans. A man is living with his stepmother. Apparently, it had become widely reported that one of the men in the fellowship, and I don't think there were many, it, there was no mega churches back then. Uh, 20, 30 people. One of the men in the fellowship at Corinth had committed sexual immorality. But here it was an extreme form of sin, one that was not even practiced by the ungodly Gentiles. W what's the hope of the body of Messiah when we're doing things that not even pagans are doing? Most versions, if you read other versions, it says the man was having illicit intercourse with his father's wife. That's confusing for a lot of people. His father's wife, that means his mother. No, it would have said his mother. His father's wife, 
That's why this CJB here, his stepmother, apparently his father was either divorced or his real mom, his biological mom, died. And this happens today. I hate to say it, but some rich old man marries a young girl. He's got some young kids, and you know what? She's bored. He doesn't do it for her, but he's out there making money. And the stepson, it happens. This isn't like, now, back then, that didn't even happen among the pagans. Today, it happens all the time. Commonplace. So, at any rate, his stepmother was probably an unbeliever because nothing is said about taking action against a rabbi. How do you get all this information from a verse? The same way you should. How does a detective come in and look at a crime scene and figure out so many things that you and I wouldn't see? Because they're detectives. They're trained. If you're trained in understanding the Word of God and you spend a ton of time in it, you'll pick these things up. Is it important to pick all these things up? Maybe not. Maybe not. I don't, I don't have an answer to that. Let's look at the next verse. And you stay proud. Now we can connect the dots. He said, your boasting is not good. And you stay proud. He's saying to them, you've got a guy sleeping with his stepmother. People know it. And you stay proud? Shouldn't you rather have felt some sadness? Shouldn't you have been ashamed and sad and ashamed for the guy? That would have led you to remove from your company, remove from your congregation, the man who has done this thing. He's asking questions, but they're all rhetorical. Paul heard about this, and he's writing a letter in regards to it. How did the Corinthians react to all this? Apparently not well by this one verse. All I have is the Bible. Instead of mourning, they were proud and haughty. Now let's look into it a little bit. Let's detect a few things, okay? Let's have some fun with the Word of God so we understand it. Perhaps they were proud, perhaps, I'm saying perhaps, I'm only detecting here, that they were proud of their tolerance in not disciplining the offender. People are proud today of being tolerant. Look at us. We're so tolerant, we accept anybody, anytime, any day. We're so loving. Kumbaya. We are the world. There's no difference. Tolerance has been around forever. Maybe they were tolerant and they were proud of that. Look at our congregation. We're not difficult. We're, we're, we love. We're the people of love. That's what it is now. Live, love, laugh. That's the mission statement of most churches today. Live, love, laugh. Live, love, laugh. Come to our congregation. You can experience life and love. Love disciplines. A loving father, the Bible says, disciplines his son. The Bible says discipline starts in the house of the Lord. The Bible says where there is no discipline, there is no love. So perhaps they were, they were proud of themselves and not disciplining the offender because of their tolerance. Another idea, perhaps they were so proud of the abundance of spiritual gifts in the church that they did not give serious thought to what had taken place. Corinth had tons of gifted people. So maybe they were overlooking it. Like, like let's say something like this happened here. And I overlooked it because I go, well, but look at what we're doing in Africa and in India and in Israel. That's a little nothing. You follow? I, somebody goes, Rabbi, you need to... Come on, I'm not going to focus on the minutia. You need to focus on all the good things that are going on. There's two columns. There's good and bad. And, and they don't interface. They're not interdependent. The good is good. The bad is bad. We glorify the good. We take care of the bad. That's the way it is. Okay? Or, better yet, my personal favorite, just detecting here, just playing spiritual detective. Perhaps they were more interested in numbers and money than in holiness. Perhaps this, guy's, this guy was a big giver, you know? And he had a lot of influence. And if they disciplined him and they lost him, maybe they'd lose half their congregation. Today, that's very popular. We don't want to offend anybody because we can't afford to lose anybody. Guess what? 
I don't say this arrogantly, but Beth Yeshua can afford to lose people. Look, we lost everybody. Somebody I found out from the accountant, somebody just sent us $20,000 to missions. So guess what we're able to do? We're able to take that 20000 and not just send out the 20000 right away. And I know you're watching. I know you want to be anonymous, so I'm not going to give you a name. But we're able to put 20000 towards it. So in the midst of difficult situations, we're able to send out $40,000. And we're also able to help Neve Michael and to help with the iPad projects. Isn't that beautiful? Because God is blessing us because hopefully we're trying to do the right thing. So I don't have to worry about losing somebody. I don't have to worry. God doesn't want me to worry. He doesn't want me to preach the word on eggshells. He wants me to preach the word. The government doesn't take care of Beth Yeshua. The Lord is our provider, not the government. That would be the day. You know how many people are on government assistance and sitting home and doing nothing? not paying any taxes, not contributing to society. It's pathetic. The bottom line is, they were not shocked by their sin, and they should have been. That's the bottom line to the story. Going back to our scriptures now, 1 Corinthians 5, 6, it says your boasting is not good. Now, now we know what they were boasting about. Prior to that, you had no clue. And it's right there. You just had to read a few more verses. Don't you know the saying, quote, it takes only a little chametz to leaven a whole bunch of dough? Now, what a batch of dough, excuse me, let's take a look at the word leaven. We're looking it up in the Greek concordance because the New Testament is written in Greek. It's zume, and it means leaven. I know, I, I have to give you what the dictionary says. I can't play around with it. Leaven means leaven. That's what it means. Leaven is leaven, okay? Like rain is rain. But it, there's a metaphor in the Greek, and it's metaphorically used for inveterate, and I'll explain that in a minute because that's a tough word for anybody, but that's the Greek dictionary. I'm just going with what's there. Inveterate mental and moral corruption. Viewed, it's viewed in its tendency. It has a tendency to infect others. Now, inveterate means chronic or habitual or deep-rooted. It means sin is a lifestyle. It means walking. It's a regular occurrence. Walking in sin as opposed to sin being a foreign invader. You follow? It's a, there's a big difference. Some people feel like, well, I, I do sin, Rabbi. Yes, join the club. Everybody does. But there's a difference between sin as a lifestyle and intermittent sin. Okay? With that being said, you have to know that in, in the Jewish culture, they would take some leftover bread, some leftover dough from the week before and just inject it into the dough for the new week because just a little bit injected would leaven the whole batch. See, he's speaking to a people in a culture that totally understood what he was saying. He was saying to them, listen to me, guys. If you let this go on with this guy and his stepmother, it's going to infect the whole congregation and before no time, it's going to fall apart. Words of wisdom, and he's using Passover to explain. They should have known, they knew that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Leaven here, as Paul's using it, is moral sin. Moral sin, not ceremonial sin, moral sin. The apostle basically is saying, Paul is saying, that if they tolerate a little moral sin in the church, it will grow and expand until the whole fellowship is seriously infected. So he was instructing them to discipline, which, forgive me, but church discipline is nowhere to be found today. Doesn't exist, right? Now, let me tell you where it does exist. Let the pastor get in sin, and boy, they're ready to chop him down. But the people, for some reason, you have a different, you guys have a different set of commandments than I have. See, I've got to obey the commandments of God. You guys, not so much. You know what I'm saying? Let a pastor, now am I sticking up for pastors? Yes, I'm sticking up for pastors because I love pastors. But I'm also sticking up for what's right. You can't have a double standard. You can't judge people by the letter of the law and judge yourself by grace. You can't judge people by what they say and judge yourself by the motivations of your heart. It's a double standard. 
there is only one standard for everybody. So, with that being said, we go to the next verse, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and he says, this is what you need to do. You see, God never just tells us what we need to get rid of. He tells us what we need to embrace. You know? It, it'd be something to tell you. You know, you've you got to stop eating that. Well, what should I eat? Give people a solution. Just don't tell them the problem. You know what the problem is? You know what the problem is? I'll tell you what the problem is. You, because you keep telling us what the problem is, but you won't give us a solution. People are so quick to tell you the problem. Even in relationships, you know what the problem is? The problem is, yes, the problem is you keep telling me what the problem is, but you never come up with a solution. It's almost like you like the problem. It's like you're codependent or something. Why don't you figure out a solution, and I'll try to abide in it? So this is what Paul is doing, because this is what God does. He gives us solutions. He gives us remedies to our diseases. He says, get rid of the old leaven so that you can be a new batch because in reality you are unleavened for our Passover lamb, the Messiah, has been sacrificed. He is, he is using the feast of Passover and unleavened bread to explain about sin and holiness and newness of life. No question about it. Let's look up the word unleavened for a moment. And it means adzumos, it's unfermented, free from leaven, Okay, free from leaven, that's, that's in the natural. Then metaphorically, free from faults or the leaven of iniquity. Okay? Paul is saying, if we can go back for a moment to 1 Corinthians 5, 7, if you wouldn't mind. He is commanding them to purge out the old leaven. In other words, he's saying they should take stern action. Stern action against the evil so that they might be new in a sense of pure lump. Hear me now. They were commanded to quarantine the sinner. Anybody know about quarantine? You do now. So that the spiritual virus wouldn't spread and infect others. Now, I find it very interesting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a shot here. I find it very interesting that the people of God of being so careful not to catch a, spiritual, a, a physical virus, but they're so cavalier about catching a spiritual virus. Now, if a, if a tornado was coming, would I warn you? Yes. Would it be ignorant for us to... Um, I, I walk at a park in the morning now, and there's a, there's a, a playground there, and I, I do a few exercises on the playground and stuff. And then I wash my hands afterwards. Now, there's a lot of little kids in that playground. And they're touching the stuff. Little kids are going to touch their face. Is that wise, what the parents are letting them do? I say no. But by the same token, I'm watching believers quarantine themselves, afraid to go out and get the mail. But they don't have the same attitude in the spirit. They're so afraid to die when to die is gain. Now, some of you guys have been believers a lot longer than me. What I'm saying is straight up, hardcore verses out of the scripture. Then Paul goes on to say we should practice this because in reality, in reality, because Yeshua died for us and we have the blood of Yeshua, figuratively speaking, on the lintel and dos post of art, we sit in heavenly places. That's our position, right? He's saying, look, guys, you're, you're born again. You've been redeemed. But your position should match your condition. You can't just say a prayer and thinking you're going to live the way you want to live and go to heaven. It's not going to happen. If you're watching and you think you said a prayer, but you're living the same way you were before you said that prayer, I'm here to tell you, you're not. And you, how dare you? The Bible dares me to tell you. No. There has to be some kind of change. I'll tell you what we need in the believing community right now. We desperately need to practice spiritual distancing. Not so much social distancing. Spiritual 
distancing. Paul is stressing exactly what God has stressed in the whole New Testament. Namely, that our creed, our beliefs, has to line up with our character. God wants our beliefs to come in line with our behavior. Although doctrinally we are positionally righteous, God is looking for us to be practically righteous as well. Then he ends, he says, for our Pesach lamb, the Messiah, has been sacrificed. That's how he ends that section. Paul's mind goes back to Passover. Of course, the good Jewish boy that he was, and still celebrating Passover, mind you, where on the eve of the first day of the feast, the eve of the first day, I remember my Bubba doing this, really. The people of God were commanded to remove all the leaven from their houses. The Jewish people went to the kneading trough and scraped it, scraped the kneading trough. They scrubbed the place where the leaven was kept till not a trace remained. They searched the place with a lamp, you know, and, and, and a spoon and a feather to make sure that none had been overlooked. Then, after they went through this arduous task of removing every ounce of leaven, they lifted up their hands to God, and this is what they said, quote, O oh God, I have cast out all the leaven from my house. If there is any leaven that I do not know of, with all my heart I cast it out too, in case I missed any. To me, that pictures the kind of separation from evil to which the Christian is called today. I would like to give you another idea about the subject, not just from Corinth, so you see that it's not just a Corinthian issue. If I stop right here, everything's fine, you get the message. The message is easy, guys. We're supposed to be on leaven. We could leave. We, I could have said that at the beginning. And I'm sure somebody's watching going, why didn't you? Because um, it, it, wouldn't have, it wouldn't have driven the point home. I have to show you. I really do. I'm, I'm trying to take time. I'm trying to help you and me. But if I stopped right here, you could say, well, it was just an issue in Corinth. No, it's an issue in the human heart. So I want to use, if you don't mind, Paul's letter to the believers in Rome. The book of Romans is probably, if not definitely, the most influential of all Bible books. Bar none. If you think about it, I'm sure you couldn't come up with another one that's more influential. Romans is a classic. To the unsaved, Romans offers a clear exposition of their sinful, lost condition and God's righteous plan for saving them. Many people, many of of. Of, of the greats, and I don't want to say who they are because some of them I don't think are so great, but the greats in Christianity were saved reading the book of Romans. Okay? So to the unsaved, it clearly talks about their lost condition. New believers learn from the book of Romans their identification with Messiah and a victory through the power of the Holy Spirit. They learn how to be victorious through the book of Romans. And mature believers, even for some of us, I shouldn't even say us. Maybe I'm not a mature believer. I don't know, but some of you that are mature believers, mature believers in the book of Romans find never-ending delight in its wide spectrum of doctrinal, prophetical, and practical truth. Now, chapter 5 of the book of Romans teaches us the benefits. Each chapter teaches us something. Chapter 5 teaches us the benefits of justification in the believer's life, meaning how blessed we are to be believers, to be sons and daughters of the Most High God. The chapter ends where Paul states emphatically that grace superabounded over all man's sins. Let me show you the last verse. Verse 21 of chapter 5 in the book of Romans is the last verse. It says, all this happened, talks about that, that grace reigns through righteousness, what Yeshua did. All this happened so that just as sin ruled by means of death, and, and I got to tell you, sin absolutely ruled in my life prior to meeting the Lord. There is no question about it. I, I thought sinfully. I didn't just act sinfully. I thought sinfully. My mind, that's the way it worked. I could remember vividly. So also, since sin ruled, so also grace might now rule through causing people. Remember in Ezekiel 30, 36, it says, I will cause you. You'll do it. 
The Holy Spirit is so powerful. The word of God is so powerful. It's gonna cause you. You can't make me. You know what my prayer is? Make me. Why would you be so stubborn? God, you can't make me. Make me. I want you to make me. And remake me. Causing people to be considered righteous so that they might have eternal life through Yeshua the Messiah, our Lord. Hallelujah. Grace reigns through righteousness. All the demands of God's holiness have been met. This is where we are right now in Romans. The penalty for lawlessness has been paid. Hallelujah. So now, because of that, because of Yeshua's death and burial, God can grant eternal life to all who come pleading the merits of Messiah, their substitute, their Zabach, okay? That's where we are theologically right now in the book of Romans. But the very next verse, or the beginning of chapter 6, raises an all-important question for the Feast of Unleavened Bread and for us today. Does the teaching of the gospel, meaning salvation by grace through faith, permit or even encourage sinful living? This letter is, is full of objections. There's an objector. It's, a, it's a, a make-believe objector. Paul's objecting to help people understand the objections that will come or the misunderstanding of what God is trying to relate to us. The answer, as we will see in a second, um, can you go back to um, 521 for a minute? Thank you, dear. The answer, as we will see, is an emphatic denial as it extends to chapters 6 through 8. It's not just the next verse. I, I'm just giving you a verse, but it's three chapters on the subject about holiness. It will help us to follow Paul's argument. You know, if you see the letter, it starts with all the fallen short of the glory of God, nobody's without an excuse, who's a Jew, went outwardly or inwardly, you know, the wages of sin is death, and then it speaks about salvation, and, and it speaks about no condemnation. And then it goes into Israel 9, Israel's past. Uh, chapter 10, Israel's present. Chapter 11, Israel's future. Then it goes on to what should we do with all this? Present yourself a living sacrifice. And then it ends. It's a beautiful, beautiful theological letter. Just gorgeous. But we will see when I put up the next screen that it will help us to follow Paul's argument in this if we understand the difference between a believer's position and a believer's practice. His position, our position, is our standing with Messiah. We are righteous positionally. No ifs, ands, or buts. But his practice is what he should be doing in his everyday life. Grace puts us in the position and then teaches us to walk worthy of it. You follow? Grace isn't just, hey man, thanks, I'm in. No, show grace some respect. Show grace a little respect and show that it was not for nothing. Oh, Yeshua paid it all. He paid it all. I don't have to do anything. Baloney. The entry fee into the kingdom is free. The annual dues will cost you your life. That's the teaching of the Bible. Saved by grace, sanctified by truth. That's the Bible. Straight up. I'm not, I'm not even making this up. It's like crystal clear. Crystal clear. Our position is absolutely perfect because we are in Messiah. Hallelujah. But our practice should increasingly correspond to our position. And I say increasingly because it should be present progressive. It never will correspond perfectly. You hear me? Let me say that again for somebody who's watching going, I feel terrible. Every time we talk about holiness, people feel terrible. My God. So, kind of sad, since God is holy. And we want to be like him, don't we? We want to be chips off the old block. I'm here to tell you that our practice will never correspond perfectly until we go where he comes. When we see Yeshua face to face, that's when we'll be glorified. And that won't even come in the millennial reign. That comes after the millennial reign. But in the meantime, we should try to become more and more conformed 
to Yeshua's image. Fair? Okay. Let's look now at 6.1 of Romans. It says, so then, all we to say, based on, oh, I'm, I'm delivered, grace, hallelujah, saved, I sit in heavenly places with Messiah. Hallelujah. So then, here's the objection. And Paul's doing this himself. It's not somebody who's talking to him. He's just thinking, you know what? Some of these knuckleheads are going to run with this. They're going to be like, wow, Christ paid it all. Good deal. Thanks, man. Cool. I'm covered. He knows. He knows human beings. He understands. So then are we to say, quote, let's keep sinning? Let's keep on sinning so that can, there can be more grace? Rhetorical question, but he asked the question. This is a very important question for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The objector comes forward with what he thinks is a clinching argument. He's saying, so if God's so graceful and he wants to pour out grace, then if we sin more, then he pours out more grace. For, for you and I, it's ridiculous, but just picture the pagan who might say that. God, God is a God of grace. He loves to bestow grace. So let's just help him out. Now, you realize the question's ridiculous, but trust me, new believers in a pagan society wouldn't understand this. And Paul's thinking about this. If the gospel of grace teaches that man's sin provides for an even greater display of God's grace, then doesn't it suggest that we should continue in sin, that grace can be all the more abundant? A modern version of this is, you say that men are saved by grace through faith apart from the law. But if all you have to do to be saved is believe, then you can go out and live in sin. In other words, should we keep on sinning so God can keep on forgiving? I think about that in your relationship. Well, my wife's very forgiving, so let me just keep on doing the wrong thing so she gets to forgive me more. Think about how ludicrous that is. Greg, I asked you when you come home, please, please don't throw your clothes on the floor. It's no big deal. I'm home. I keep a tidy house, please. Well, Byrne, I keep doing it because I know how forgiving you are, so I just want to bless you with more opportunities to forgive me. Okay, if that's what you're thinking, listen to me. I'm not a psychiatrist, but you need a mental institution and, and, and drugs immediately. The emphatic answer that Paul gives is heaven forbid, meaning heaven forbids it. God forbids it. God forbids it. When you say heaven forbid, do you know what you're saying? You're saying that God says no. No. You shall not sin more so I can forgive more. No. In 1 John it says, my little children, if you sin, it does not say when you sin. When you sin is defeat us. Well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Jesus paid it all. Wow. What a way to run the, you don't, let me ask you something, man. I know, I know some of you people, I've met you. You say that. But when you run your business, you don't run your business like that. Uh-uh. You're there, you're there like 24-7, making sure you get every nickel. You know how many people in, in the faith jumped on this, this, this plan that the government extended even if they didn't need it? They had money in the bank, but they thought, hey, a free loan. Why? Money. Free money. So you're, you're cavalier with your relationship with God, but in the business world, you are on it. You give God, you give your business your all. Sports, you don't miss a game. You exercise, you love your body, man, it's my temple. You hear what I'm saying? There's nobody that's going to refute me. Why? Because it's irrefutable. Rabbi, that sounds arrogant. No, I'm just saying that's the way it is. Let's look at a few more verses. I don't get to talk to people as much anymore, so I, I want to stay here for like three hours. Because every time I go to talk to somebody, they won't talk to me. If I wave, when I'm walking in the park, they, I, I don't know if they think a wave can give it to them, but I think they do. Like if I go like this, they, did he just throw corona at me? It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Do you see how spooked people are in a, in a store? Again, I'm not being glib. I'm just saying 
Wow, I wish they were spooked about spiritual viruses like that. Okay, Romans 6, 17 to 19 says this, by God's grace, you who were once slaves to sin, this, this is all about redemption and being free. This time of the year is all about freedom, deliverance. You who were once slaves to sin, sl- sin was your master, obeyed from your heart the pattern of teaching to which you were exposed, you were exposed to this, and after you had been set free from sin, redemption, you became enslaved to righteousness. So, are, are you no longer enslaved? You're, you're still a slave. I mean, Yeshua called himself a slave. My God. The Messiah, the only unique begotten Son of God, our Savior, the prophesied deliverer of Israel, called himself a slave. So we're still slaves, but to righteousness. Paul says, I'm using popular language. Paul was... <laughs> If Paul used the language that he wanted to use, that he was accustomed to, nobody would understand him. Paul, it, would, it would have been normal for Paul to speak in five, six, seven syllable words. He was an absolute brilliant. He was the kind of guy that would score 1,600 on the SAT. He just would. He was just a brilliant intellectual man. And he was using simple language for the commoner. I got news for you. If you're brilliant, surely you can understand simplicity. But there's more simple people than aren't Rhodes Scholars. They can't understand complexity. So you're best speaking simple. That's what I'm doing with the book of Revelation. I'm making it so simple. So you'll get the gist of it without getting bogged down in the minutia where you get lost. You get lost in in the mark of the beast. You You get lost in the two witnesses. People are fighting. Well, who are those two witnesses? What's the difference? They're two mighty men of God that are going to be imbued with incredible power to witness to the lost souls of Israel in the last half of the tribulation. If, you, if God wanted you to know who they were, he would have told you, it's not important, but you get caught up with it. Well, you think it's, you think it's Moses and Elijah? No, Enoch, Enoch got taken up. What are you doing, man? This has to stop. So I'm going to make it very simple. And if it's too simple for you, oh well. I'm using popular language because your human nature is so weak. For just as you used to offer your various parts as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, which led to more lawlessness, so ridiculous to be lawless. So ridiculous to say the law was nailed. It's just, it's absurd. It's so unbelievably unscriptural. So now offer your various parts as slaves to righteousness, which leads to being made holy, set apart. That's sanctification, set apart, consecrated, set apart. That's unleavened bread right there. That's why we chose those scriptures or God chose those scriptures. The Lord wants, again, our state to correspond to our standing or our practice to correspond to our position. He's trying to avoid the high talk, low walk syndrome that the Pharisees had. They talked a good game. A lot of people talk a good game. You ever see somebody on an interview? They sound like the best thing since sliced bread, and then they get to work, and you go, I can't believe I hired this guy. Anybody know what I'm talking about? (laughs) The phrase free from sin does not mean that they no longer had a sin nature. We We will have a sin nature till we're glorified. The sin nature is what produces sins. We will have a sin nature. Everybody has one that's listening to me, including yours truly. So it doesn't mean that we won't longer have a sin nature once we're saved, and it doesn't mean that we won't no longer commit acts of sin. Get that out of your mind. The context, though, shows that he is referring to freedom from sin as a dominating power in our lives. You follow? As the dominating force. Sin is not the dominating force. The Savior is. And if you were honest with yourself, you'd realize, yes, Rabbi, is sin, but it's not the dominating force. I guarantee you it's not the dominating force. You just have the same problem I have, that when I sin, we take out the magnifying glasses, and then we invite Satan and his demonic forces to the sin party, and then we let him, you know, put us on the witness stand, and then Yeshua is nowhere to be found as our advocate because he's too busy, you know, with some other person's case. And then the Lord doesn't want to talk to us because he gives us the hand because he's done, and that's what we do. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? That is not healthy. Trust me, I've done it my whole believing life. It's not healthy, not good, not good. He's saying true believers, though, will never live as slaves to sin, for God has transformed their hearts of conversion so that they will now grow 
in their love of righteousness and live according to God's word. Because of the people's intellectual and spiritual difficulty in understanding truth, which I mentioned before, Paul uses an illustration from everyday life that they can all understand. Truth often needs to be illustrated in order to become intelligible. Basically, he's stressing the importance of giving oneself wholly over to God. Now, we looked at it in the congregation in Corinth. We looked at it from this quintessential theological letter in Romans. I just want you to see it in a couple other places, and then I'm done. I know it's a little long, but um, but you know what? I love the Word of God. That's what. And you're watching at home, so if it's too much for you, you it's easy, right? You're not going to turn me off, but you can turn your set off, right? What am I apologizing for? My God. Let's look. So, so we've seen Paul speak about it in Romans and in Corinthians. Peter says the same thing. 1 Peter 1, 14, 16. As people who obey God, do not let yourselves be shaped by the evil desires you used to have when you were still ignorant. On the contrary, see, he doesn't say, don't do this. Do this. Following the Holy One who called you, become holy yourselves in your entire way of life. Since the Tanakh, the acronym for the Old Testament, Torah, Nevim, Ketuvim, Writings, And the prophet says, you ought to be holy because I am holy. This is God speaking. He says in Leviticus, right? So Peter begins the letter, if you look at the first 13 verses, by talking about the glories of our salvation, okay? And the illustrious position we have as believers. He starts off on a good note. He's basically saying, man, we're so lucky. What lucky beggars we are. Man, we're so blessed. Man, we're so blessed. We're saved. We're on to glory land. An eternity of bliss. Guys, I know it doesn't look like that right now, but that's because you're temporal. You're looking at the here and now. Why are you focusing on the here and now? All of us are dying. I don't care care how many new nutrients you find out about. I don't care what's the latest, latest juice out of the Amazon. I don't care how much wrinkle cream you put on. I don't care. You're gonna die. But if you're born again, you're gonna live forever and you won't need wrinkle cream. So he talks about what I just kind of went nuts over, forgive me, but I'm excited. I have a disease. I'm excited to be disease-free. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. I'm excited to eat the leaves of the tree of life that Revelation speaks about, the healing of the nations. I'm excited to have complete, perfect health. Yes, I'm excited. Yes, I can't wait. Looking very forward to it. So forgive me for my emphatic little minor tirade there but he moves on from there here and he says now i want to discuss about practical righteousness he's saying while living on this earth believers have to fight the desires of sin you have to fight it in fact to be humble you have to practice humility and let me just say if you're watching you're a non-believer it's much easier to swallow your pride than to try to chew humble pie He's saying that living on earth, believers have to fight the desire of sin. So they are called to be obedient children. That's what obedient children do. They obey their parent. They have to separate themselves from evil in all that they do. If they conform to the ungodly world, they are denying their heavenly character. They are not giving grace its due. You have a heavenly character. And if you conform to the world, you're denying that. The things they did in the days of their ignorance should be put away now that they have been enlightened. No longer ignorant. We're not ignorant. We used to ignore. I ignored the truth because I didn't know the truth. And now I'm enlightened. The light has come in, enlightened by the Spirit, and it is illuminated in my heart what I should be doing. Hebrews 12, 14, we don't know the author. People say, Paul, I could care less. Hebrews 12, 14, it says, keep pursuing shalom with everyone and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now, some of you pursue holiness, but you don't pursue peace with people. You're loners. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. He loves me. I love the Lord. He loves me. Well, guess what? If you really loved him, you'd love what he loves, which is us. In the midst of persecution, they're being persecuted. The Jewish believers were being encouraged onto holiness. Can you imagine? I mean, that's what you got for me. I'm being persecuted, and and you want me to be holy? Look where it's gotten me. He's saying, keep pressing forward in the light of God's great mercies towards us. Look at the witnesses that are watching from above. Come on, 
Show them what you got. The thought here is that holiness is clearly expected of all believers. This is not a salvation by works, mind you. Believers are sanctified once and for all by the death of Messiah. Let me say that again. Believers are sanctified once and for all by the death of Messiah. But holy living is a part of the perseverance that is encouraged throughout Hebrews. It's the evidence of being saved. If you want to know an evidence, you know, like I talked about a crime scene before. If you want to see the evidence, there might be a murder weapon. There might be some DNA. There might be some... You know what the evidence of you being saved is? That you're living, that you're persevering, and you're trying to be holy. That's the evidence of a, of a believer. Last but not least, we heard it from Peter. We heard it from Paul. Let's hear it from Yeshua, the most important, okay? John 17, 15 through 17, this is his final, the third and final public prayer, okay? Third and final public prayer right before he's going to be arrested. Very, very important prayer. 26 sentences of a prayer. He says, and I picked a few verses, it says, I don't ask you, he's speaking to the Father now, I don't ask you to take them out of the world. He didn't ask his disciples to be taken out. Guess what? We're his disciples. The word doesn't change. God's the same yesterday and today. He's not, I know you want to just go, some of you. I just want to go. I know you're not going. Because he's not going to ask the Father to take you out of the world. But to protect them from the evil one. That's good. If, if Yeshua is praying to God to protect me from the evil one, no offense, I, I'll take any prayer I can get, but that's, that's a good one. They do not belong to the world, Father, just as I don't belong to the world. Set them apart for holiness, sanctify them, unleaven them by means of the truth. Your word is truth. So the Lord did not pray that the Father should take believers home to heaven immediately. They wanted to. But no, that was not his prayer. Why? They have to be left here to grow in grace and to witness for Messiah. Why are you here? To grow in grace and to witness for Messiah. Why am I here? To grow in grace and witness for Messiah. Rabbi, what's my purpose? To grow in grace and witness for Messiah. Doesn't mean you can't hang out with your family and go on a vacation, uh, that you can't go to a restaurant with friends, that you can't go see a bowl game. No. But if you want to know your purpose, it's to grow in grace and witness for Messiah. Yeshua flat out prays for their sanctification. Flat out prays for them to become unleavened. The sanctification process involves separating ourselves from participating in and being influenced by evil and growing in holiness in our attitudes, our thoughts, and actions. As believers, we need to believe and think and live according to the truth. What is this truth? The Word of God, the Bible. The word of God, for the word of God is the standard of truth. It's the standard. It's the gold standard of truth against which everything else must be tested and compared. In other words, take whatever you're thinking about and, and line it up with the Bible. And if it doesn't line, chuck it. When we read and obey the word, it sanctifies our life. Nothing has a sanctifying effect like the word of God. Nothing. That's why the Bible says, wash me in the word. Now, before we leave, before we leave, I want to share something with you that I think is really important. Obviously, I think it's all important, but look at 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, therefore, okay, we're coming to the close. Therefore, if anyone is united with the Messiah, he is a new creation. The old has passed. Look, what has come is fresh and new. Some uninstructed people, folks, may think that Old habits, evil thoughts, and lustful looks are forever done away with. And everything literally becomes new at the time of our salvation. In other words, you think, well, I'm saved now, so I'm not going to have lustful looks. I'm, I'm not going to love money anymore. No. Sorry. It'd be nice. But no, you got to work it. you got to work it. Because if you work it, it's going to have value. And if it has value, you'll cling to it. But if you could turn on and off your holiness, then you'd go, well, it's just one night. I'll turn it off. And then in the morning, I'll just turn it back on. Not so easy. You wouldn't appreciate it. You must go through the sanctification process. And I'm here to tell you, it is lifelong. 
and let me help you with seeing it. Leviticus 23, 6 talks about this unleavened bread. It says, on the 15th day, which was seven days ago, of the same month, Nisan, is the festival of matzah, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which we're completing today. For seven days, you are to eat matzah. Now, if this was only just to eat matzah, that's ridiculous, because I eat matzah, you know, we eat matzah all year round. So it's not just about eating matzah. It's not just about food. That's ridiculous. The kingdom isn't about food. So let's look up the word unleavened in the Hebrew, and we're going to see something interesting. Unleavened means matzah, and it means unleavened. Okay, let's go to the root word. The root is what I want you to see. The root word is matzatz, and it means to drain out or withdraw gradually. Now, look at that. If that doesn't paint a beautiful picture of hope, and if that doesn't paint a beautiful picture for us to know that this is a lifelong process, nothing will. We can't drain this spiritual swamp overnight. It just is going to take time. And God's okay with that. It's a lifelong process. I want to end with something that is going to be very strange. And I told a friend of mine who's a pastor, I said, I'm going to teach something and it's not going to be traditional. He goes, when the heck did you ever teach anything traditional? Um, it's when Yeshua washed the disciples' feet. Now everybody knows about that. Um, It's, it's a very poignant part. There was just a, a meal that he was attending with his disciples, almost like a last meal, if you will. And then John 14, 15, 16, he gives his last words. 17, he prays. 18, he's arrested. This is the end, the tail end of his ministry. And right before he goes, he washes their feet. Let's take a look at the first five verses in John 13. It says it was just before the festival of Passover and Yeshua knew that the time had come for him to pass from this world to the Father. Having loved his own people in the world, he loved them to the end. Never stopped loving them. They were at supper, so this isn't the Passover supper, and the adversary, the enemy, had already put the desire to betray him into the heart of Yehuda ben Shimon from Kiriot. Yeshua was aware that the Father had put everything in his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. He could have taken that away, but this was the very purpose for him to come. I've come to seek and save the lost, he said in Luke 19.10. This was his purpose. So he arose from the table, removed his outer garments, and wrapped a towel around his waist. Then he poured some water into a basin and began to wash the feet of the Talmudim and wipe them off with the towel wrapped around him. Can you imagine? And just so you know, I think it's important. Foot washes were common in the first century. The task was performed by a house slave. That was their test, to wash people's feet. It was a culture where people walk long distances on dusty roads and sandals, and it was customary for the host to arrange for water to be available for the washing of feet. Like sometimes we go to a restaurant, we have valet parking. That's, that's what it was like in the first century. You had a foot washer. The sight, though, of the divine Son of God in the role of a servant is quite disturbing to me, to say the least. I remember when I first went to see Samuel in India. He's watching right now, and he'll remember this. We dedicated the school we built it was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people there. And I know that I needed to establish him as the leader, not me. The people all came out to see me because they knew that we built the school and I was Rabbi Greg, you know, the apostle. But I knew that was a mistake. You know why? Because I knew I was leaving and he was going to stay. It's like guest preaching. Anybody can guest preach. You blow in, you blow up, you blow out. Anybody can take a kid for a day and buy him ice cream and take him to a museum. That's easy. It's easy being a grandparent. It's not easy being a parent. And I knew I had to establish his leadership and his father's leadership. So I said, Lord, what do I do? He says, you know what to do. So I asked Monty, I said, can you get me a basin? Can you get me some water? 
And in the midst of a plethora of people, there must have been a thousand people, I asked that they would sit down, and they sat down, Devadas, his father, and Samuel. And then I started to walk over the basin, and they literally jumped up out of their seat, and they ran. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not making this up. I had a few people with me. This was my second trip to India, and they will attest to what I'm telling you. I am not exaggerating one iota. They got up and ran, and I begged them to come back, and they said, no, no, you won't wash our feet. I said, Samuel, I have to. Please sit there. And they were weeping as I was washing their feet. If Samuel, who is a giant in the faith, and Devadas, who is a giant in the faith, could weep from a slug like me washing their feet, how much should we weep from Messiah washing us? What an incredible lesson for us all. But there's something else I want to get to. That's the obvious lesson. I want to get to what's not so obvious. Look at the next few verses, 6 through 8, John 13. It says, He came to Shimon Kepha, he is Yeshua, who said to him, this is Shimon speaking, Peter, Lord, you are washing my feet? Yeshua answered him, quote, You don't understand yet what I'm going to do. But in time you will understand. No, he says, emphatic, no, said Kepha. You will never wash my feet. Yeshua answered him, if I don't wash you, you have no share with me. So the meaning of the foot washing is now being unfolded. To have no share with Yeshua means that one does not belong to him. Here the foot washing symbolizes the washing necessary for the forgiveness of sins in anticipation of, in anticipation of Yeshua's death, by which sins are forgiven. We're on 2,000 years on the other side of the cross, right? So he's saying, I have to wash you. I have to wash you with the blood of my sacrifice, otherwise you will have no part in me. God cannot forgive you unless you're covered in my blood. He cannot accept you in his presence. Here we go. Last two verses, 9 and 10, John 13. Lord, Shimon replies, he realizes he wants to be with him, right? He wants to be with him. Not only my feet, wash my hands and my head too. Like he's overwhelmed now. He doesn't want to take any chances like, wash me clean. Give me a bath. Yeshua said to him, quote, a man who has had a bath doesn't need to wash. Now, he was just coming to a party in Yeshua's honor. You know he took a bath. But after he took a bath from his house and he walked to where they were having dinner, his feet got dirty because he's wearing sandals and he's on a dusty road. So listen to what Yeshua is doing here. I think this is, forgive me, but this could be another one of Rabbi Greg's obsessive nuttiness that sees something that isn't even there, and then everybody else goes, huh, yeah, guy's nuts. A man who has had a bath doesn't need to wash except his feet. His body is already clean. And you people are clean, but not all of you, meaning Judas, of course. The bath, I think, because he's making a distinction between a bath and washings, without a doubt to me. If, if you don't agree, it's okay. It's okay, really. I want to share it with you, though, because I think it's so cool. The bath refers to the one-time justification from the penalty of sin. The one time we are saved, we are saved. Locked, done. The washings, though, is the constant, continual cleansing from the pollution of sin. Anybody with me? Anybody can see it now? Even though, what do we do? We read the story, and what do we do? Yeshua is, is, is humble. He's a humble servant. We need to be a humble servant. Yes, that's the obvious. But I think there's something bigger in here, because he's going to die, and he's leaving, and he wants them to know something. That sin is going to come after you. It's crouching at the door. Hear me. Hear me. As believers, we walk through the world and we pick up unholy things like vile talk and other things and we get soiled. Right? You know, we're home in our house. We're, it's in the morning, my morning time. I got the Bible. I'm crying. I'm praying. I'm reading. Everything's good. But then I go out in the world. 
And I'm, I'm kind of protected, but you know what? A joke here, a thought there, a look here, and all of a sudden you're soiled. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? We all do. But I want this to be an encouragement to you guys. Listen to me. The cleansing takes place by the washing of the word. As we read it, study it, discuss it, and of course live it, it cleanses us. If we neglect it, if we neglect the word, we don't have a barrier, and the easier it is for these wicked influences to remain. We don't get washed, and they stay, and they stay, and they stay, and they stay. Therefore, I believe that Yeshua is teaching to his disciples and to us, there's one bath, but many washings. And to me, that's incredibly encouraging. Incredibly encouraging. So let me leave you with a quote from Romans. It says, so then, are we to say let's keep on sinning so there could be more grace? Heaven forbid. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? Don't you know that those of us who have been immersed into the Messiah Yeshua have been immersed into his death? Through immersion into his death, we were buried with him so that just as through the glory of the Father, the Messiah was raised from the dead, likewise, we too might live in a new life. We know that our old self was put to death on the execution stake with him so that the entire body of our sinful propensities might be destroyed, and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. What this is saying is, if Yeshua could die for our sins, then we have to try to die to them. We have to see the old man. We have to see, I have to see the old Greg. I, I don't want to talk about the old Greg, because the old Greg was, you have no idea. Was I the chief of sinners? No, but I was high on the list. Yes. And I know many others were probably just like me, but I can't talk about anybody else. I don't know anybody else. We have to, as believers, I'm telling you, this Feast of Unleavened Bread, we have to see the old man. I need you to see the old man, that old you, the way God sees him on the cross crucified. He's dead. Do you know, there's a very famous theologian, uh, St. Augustine, and I wasn't crazy about his anti-Semitic thoughts and his propensity for supersessionism and replacement theology. With that being said, though, there is a story I want to share with you. He had a mistress before he was saved. He probably had a bunch of them, but he had this one on the side. It was his regular mistress, his regular go-to girl. And after he got saved reading Romans, he was walking in the street, and his mistress saw him, and she started coming towards him. And as she came towards him, he started to walk away very fast. And she said, Augustine, it's me. And he turned, and he looked over his back, and he said, but it's no longer me. You got to crucify that old man, because he wants to rear his ugly head. He's not going to leave you alone. Therefore, on this feast, as we come to a close, and we won't celebrate it again for another year, I don't think we have to wait another year. I think we should continue to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread, not by eating matzah, but by living unleavened. Let us bury the old leaven and live in the newness of life in Messiah Yeshua through the power of the Holy Spirit. Chag Sameach and amen. Let's stand together. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of all Peace, Yeshua. Yo er anoi pono velecha, vehunecha. Yesa adonoi pono velecha, viasem lecha, 
Shalom. Chag Sameach, guys. Revelation. This Saturday. Two days. Hallelujah.